Okay, here we go. We're going to try as much as, as, as best we can to get through uh, chapter four of John Dewey's Art as Experience. So the chapter four title is uh, The Act of Expression, and I think we can, get, we can get through at least most of it in this video. I want to try to keep it about around 30 minutes, maybe 35 minutes tops. And uh, if we have time, I doubt we will, we might move on to the next chapter, chapter five, the expressive object. We'll probably have to save that uh, for the next video. We might even have to save some of this chapter uh, for the next video as well. We'll get through most of it though. And once we get through this, we really, once we're done with these chapters, with the, the first four chapters, um, we're really gonna have a, a pretty good grasp of Dewey's overall theory. So the next few videos in the series when we go over the expressive object and uh, what's the name of the chapter? The uh, common substance of the arts, uh, where he talks about medium uh, and, and you know this idea of artistic medium in general and some of that stuff, you know, uh, there's a chapter on form uh, and shape. All that stuff is kind of like, Nice to know, but not necessary. I think a fully appreciated uh, series. So I'll indicate at the beginning of those videos uh, that really these are just for like total nerds, you know, maybe philosophy majors, artists who are just curious uh, and want to learn more about Dewey. Uh, but again, I'll let you know when we get to those videos and you'll be able to kind of skip ahead. I'd recommend you do watch the concluding video uh, where I kind of try to tie it all together. So that, that definitely I wouldn't skip. Uh, if you're one of my students, especially at U of H, I wouldn't skip that one. Uh, if you're going to write a paper about Dewey and you want to understand him fully, uh, I would definitely watch the concluding video and everything up to this point, really. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me take a quick, a quick uh, swig of water and um, we'll get started with this quote. We didn't have time for it in the last video, but I mentioned, you know, for Dewey, um, and we already started on this point. Expression is not simply just the um, outburst of emotion, right? For him, expression always implies a medium, right, through which the emotion is channeled. And it's not a direct sort of outburst. You, you know, in the video before, I gave a few examples. One was, you know, the, the, the boss yelling at the employee for whatever reason because they're angry, they're not working. This is not for, for Dewey expression proper. There's always a sort of tension in the environment, uh, and that tension is overcome. For Dewey, this is indicative of all aesthetic experience. But when we speak of expression, again, these emotions are channeled through something through some instrument in the environment and some artistic product is brought forth. And um, anyway, what's going on here? I, I'm not sharing my screen, I guess. Let me go back to sharing it. I don't know what that was about. Okay, anyway, sorry for that interruption. But anyway, so he gave, in the last video, he gave the example of the child and, and how, you know, or the infant, the baby, right? When the baby is first born and just cries and screams and giggles or whatever, and it's not only really aware of what it's really, the meaning of its expression. It's just reacting from some natural impulse. Um, for, for Dewey, that's not expression proper. It's not until the baby has learned uh, to point when it needs something or to cry when it, it's hungry. And it, it understands the consequences of these expressions, right? So that's one reason that he, he distinguishes expression from just emotional outburst, right? That's one difference, okay? Sort of one, 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 one example he gives to support his case. But here we have in this um, example, he's giving sort of an etymological Argument, in other words, the origin of the word expression. If we look at where it, what it what it originally means, archaic, you know, maybe the archaic meaning, um, it always does involve this squeezing out, this pressing forth. He says, and he uses this example of the wine press and the grapes as an analogy. Juice is expressed when grapes are crushed in the white wine press. To use a more prosaic comparison, lard and oil are rendered when certain fats are subjected to heat and pressure. Maybe that's a better metaphor for him because, again, there's always this, this pressure, this obstacle, something getting in the way of direct discharge of emotion. Okay, 
uh, maybe it's maybe it's social niceties, whatever. But we, or maybe it's unrequited love. I love someone, they don't love me back, and so I have no way to express that love directly, but through a work of art, a poem, or something. So nothing is pressed forth except from original, raw, or natural material. But it's equally true that the mere issuing forth or discharge of raw material is not expression. It takes the wine press as well as the grapes to express juice. And so how does that, how does that um, parallel to artistic expression? It takes environing and resisting objects. Again, these obstacles that get in the way of direct discharge, as well as, and I guess this is the grapes in the analogy, the internal emotion, right? That juice inside, that impulsion uh, to constitute an expression. So you need that, that inner impulse and the out, that outward strife and tension. This is what we mean, uh, Dewey says, by uh, expression. The thing expressed is wrung from the producer by the pressure exercised by objective things upon the natural impulses and tendencies. Kind of repeating what I just said, right? There's always an outer uh, obstacle in the way of direct discharge. So far is expression from being the direct and immaculate issue of the latter, right? Again, it's not a, a, a direct issuing forth of emotion it's an indirect through the um through the channel of a medium an artistic medium in this case the act of expression that constitutes a work of art is a construction in time not an instantaneous emission so there's a pause between the inspiration and the creation right so that's that's basically what he's saying the artist has the inspiration and and the artist works on the work of art to bring that original impulse to fruition in an actual work of art. That's expression for, for, uh, for Dewey. And this, and this statement, he says, signifies a great deal more than that it takes time for a painter to transfer his imaginative, his imaginative conception to canvas and for the sculptor to complete his chipping of marble. So it's, it's more than just that. It's more than just this sort of um, pause and this, this, this drawn out nature of it that makes it expression. It means, and, and for, for Dewey, I suppose this is key, it means that the expression of the self in and through a medium constituting the work of art is itself a prolonged interaction of something issuing from the self with objective conditions, a process in which both of them acquire a form and order they did not at first possess. So in other words, there's that initial artistic inspiration, but as, as, as the artist begins to work through the piece and to bring the, the work of art into existence, back up here, let me do that, um, right? It means that the expression of the self in the medium, blah, blah, blah. it's a prolonged interaction, right? It, and so my, my, my initial inspiration might be thwarted by other obstacles, right? I might come to the realization that I can't quite use that color on, on that canvas because of what I've done before with previous brush strokes, right? Or simply, you know, because of the size of the canvas, I might be limited to my original conception, right? But I still have that, I still have that, that, that thing I want to express that emotion, the juice, right? If I'm the grape, I want that juice that I want to, you know, discharge or whatever into the work. Uh, and it's going to come out one way or the other, right? But there'll be these conditions that, again, we're not there at the beginning, right? My, 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 um, my impulse from within will be transformed in this process, right? And it will, it'll, it will acquire a form, an order it didn't at first possess. So when excitement about the subject matter goes deep, it stirs up a store of attitudes and meanings derived from prior experience. As they are aroused into activity, they become conscious thoughts and emotions, emotionalized images, right? This is what the artist is going through as he creates. To be set on fire by a thought or scene is to be inspired. What is kindled must either burn itself out, turning into ashes, or must press itself out in material that changes the latter from crude metal into a refined product. You know what I'm imagining as I look at these pictures of the, the mural artist, right? This Ernesto Maranje, I'm not sure if I pronounce his name correctly, but you know, I mean, I can imagine his, his, his original 
his original image or his original intention must have been somehow through this process of trial and error of trying to get this mural and this image on the side of this building surely there must have been points in this 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 um, process of creation in which he had to step back look at the building right step back and see the full picture maybe he had to change a little bit darken the beak a little bit brighten it a bit it looks different up close than it does from the ground so this process is probably long and drawn out but that doesn't mean that it wasn't something that was um directly tied to his emotions it wasn't mechanical right so once the art artistic inspiration um begins that's not a guarantee of the end product right the end product is a result of the artist dealing with the environment that the art and the deal with the, the, the environment with, with, with the medium, particularly, whether it be paint or dance or whatever, and the limit limitations of that medium in order to express themselves. And so there's really no telling, you know, when, when the, when the writer sets out to write their novel, there's really no telling, you know, what exactly is going to be the end product. There's this inspiration, there's this general, you know, understanding of where they want to go, but once he or she sits down to write that first page, there's no telling what the finished product is going to be like. And I'm, I'm assuming that, that the process is very similar here in the creation of a mural. As Dewey writes, inflamed inner material must find objective fuel upon which to feed through the interaction of the fuel with material already a fire, the refined and formed product comes into existence. The act of expression is not something which supervenes upon an inspiration already complete. It is a carrying forward to completion of an inspiration by means of the objective material of perception and imagery, right? Again, kind of reemphasizing the point I was just making. And again, this notion of strife, turmoil, this is necessary. There has to be something at stake um, do we seem to think in order for expression to occur, there has to be something outwards, some tension, something that requires a response by the, the living creature to use a term of his. So in, as he writes, an impulsion cannot lead to expression save when it is thrown into commotion, turmoil. Unless there is compression, nothing is expressed, right? Unless that wine press is pressing down and squeezing the grapes, you don't get any juice. Okay? The turmoil marks the place where inner impulse and contact with the environment, either in fact or in idea, meet and create a ferment. The war dance and the harvest dance of the savage do not issue from within except there be an impending hostile raid or crops that are to be gathered to generate the indispensable excitement that there must be something at stake, something momentous and uncertain, like the outcome of a battle or the prospects of a harvest, right? So there has to be some concern for the work of art. The artist has something inside them they want to bring forth and there's something at stake in every brush stroke, okay? to try to bring the analogy back to art. So for him, when we have these impulses, I keep using that word, right? But really, you know, we might be just fine just to talk about emotions. We talk about <clears throat> emotions. For Dewey, they're always directed, okay? So an emotion is always to or from or about something objective, right? Whether something in fact or in idea, okay? Whether it's something out there in the world that I see an object, uh, factually, so we might say scientifically, or whether it's just some sort of impending doom, right? Again, the uh, impending raid, as mentioned in the last uh, slide, the example he was giving. Emotion, again, is always directed to, from, away from, or about a certain thing. And Besides this too, and this should be a bit of a review, if you paid it, if you were paying attention, you were following some of the earlier things we said in the first few lectures about the um, living creature, the live creature, and 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 the significance of their environment. The second part here should not be so surprising. What he says about emotions. In fact, it should be a bit of a review. Like I said, not only are emotions direct, directional, right? They're always to, from, or about something objective. But they're always in a situation. They're always embedded 
situated, implicated, as he puts it here, in a situation, the issue of which is in suspense and in which the self that is moved in the emotion is vitally concerned, right? So again, something is at stake. Situations are depressing, threatening, intolerable, triumphant. Joy in the victory won by a group with which a person is identified is not something internally complete, nor is sorrow upon the death of a friend anything that can be understood save as an interpenetration of self with objective conditions, right? So in other words, you know, when I lose a friend, right, when I lose a loved one or something like this, obviously that's a personal um, emotion. I mean, nobody's gonna understand my grief the way that I am. But for him, that emotion is a result not of my own sort of like, I'm not like a solipsistic subjectivity that's completely shut out from that world out there when I'm grieving. Quite the opposite, right? Emotions are always situated. Why am I sad? I'm thinking of all the great times I had with this person, what that person meant to me, all those times that I never, you know, think I'm not going to see them again and be able to do, I'm starting to get teary eyed because I just, yeah, I just lost someone pretty close to me pretty recently. But, you know, the, these emotions, they're visceral and, and they're, they're real because they, they, inter, they interpenetrate ourselves, right? And when we talk about artistic expression, right, emotion is always involved, right? And so emotions involved, what that means is that it, it involves our environment and it, it, it involves a, um, as he puts it sometimes, a reflexive interaction between the self and the environment. So when we try to articulate our emotions, we find a lot of difficulty to do this in a way that is absolutely accurate. This is where art comes to help us, says Dewey, right? Uh, he says the un unduplicated character, the unique unduplicated character of experienced events and situations impregnates the emotion that is evoked. Were it the function of speech to reproduce that to which it refers, we could never speak of fear, but only of fear of this particular oncoming automobile with all its specifications of time and place, or fear under specified circumstances of drawing a wrong conclusion from such and such data, okay? A lifetime would be too short to reproduce in words a single emotion. So what is he saying here, right? You know, my, my grief, you know, for my, you know, for losing my loved one, right? Again, it's so unique. It's so special to me because no one knows our relationship, right? Only I understand how I knew this person. So to, for me to get you to understand it, you have to be me. And there's too many details, right? Uh, fear of an oncoming car, right? I mean, I might be more scared of it in one situation than another, depending on my constitution, who I am. If I'm a frog, right? Like, so I got the frogger uh, uh, logo here. Right? But art, art is a way to articulate this in a way that is more direct and more effective than simply just listing facts. Right? I can list all the facts about you know, the person that I've lost. I can, I can list all those facts. But for it to emotionally hit home, for you to even get any sort of inkling of what it's like to grieve the way I might be grieving right now, for, um, for Dewey, it, it requires artistic expression, right? It requires artistic expression, and, and that's a way more effective way to get the point across than through some rational discourse. So he writes, in reality, however, the poet and novelist have an immense advantage over even an expert psychologist in dealing with emotion. For the former build upon a concrete situation and permit it to evoke emotional response. Instead of a description of an emotion in intellectual and symbolic terms, the artist does the deed that breeds the emotion, right? So for Dewey, you know, you can watch the film Boys in the Hood, or you could, you could read this book on race 
and police brutality. But for him, you're not going to really understand what it's like to live in the hood, right, in this case. And, and, and you, you really probably never can unless you have been that person. I mean, you make that argument. You never really understand what it's like to be brutalized by police or whatever unless you have been harassed by police in your life, right? So then you can kind of imagine it. But if you have it, the closest you're going to come to it is through art, right? If art is effective. Okay, so for instance, if, if Boys in the Hood is a good movie and you watch that scene where they're pulled over and harassed and, you know, by this cop, you know, and, and the, the tensity, so the tenseness and the emotion in that scene, if it grips you, it makes you feel uneasy, that is going to be a way more effective way of explaining the problem of, you know, race relations and police brutality than some sociological study, right? Even though the sociological study might more be based in science and this sort of thing. It might be something that, that's better to base policy decisions on. But if we're going to try to understand and try to, um, to, to empathize, like maybe it's a good word, if we're gonna try to empathize with the plight of somebody in the situation, it's really the, the, the art, right? The, the, the artistic expression that's gonna help us do that a lot better than any, any sociological study or psychological study ever would. Now, he wants us to be careful here because, you know, I think for, for Dewey, and I agree with him wholeheartedly on this, you know, there's something about art that is too didactic, right? It's just, it's trying too hard to teach you a lesson, right? And so he's not saying that, right? He's not saying that every piece of art should be an after school special. In fact, if it tries to do this, right, if there's, you know, this overt intention of, of morality, you know, behind every character, it tends to distract from and denigrate the, uh, the, the, the effectiveness of the art, of the art product. So, so Dewey writes, in reading a novel, even one written by an expert craftsman, one may get a feeling early in the story that a hero or heroine is doomed. Doomed not by anything inherent in situations and character, but by the intent of the author, who makes the character a puppet to set forth his own cherished idea. The painful feeling that results is resented, not because it's painful, but because it's foisted upon us by something that we feel comes from outside the movement of the subject matter, right? Now, I'll probably get a lot of crap for this because I know there's a lot of great people about, you know, people that like, like Ayn Rand, they really like Ayn Rand, and so they <clears throat> tend to take offense at any criticism of her. This is my big problem with her novels, right? I think she's a pretty lousy philosopher. I'll get a crap for that too. But she's probably, she's not as lousy, I think, as academic philosophers um, make her out to be. I think her argument is not quite as weak as they present it. So they, they're kind of unfair to her. Of course, she's unfair to most other philosophers. She was quite a hack when it came to like the philosophical tradition. You, you read some of her criticism of Aristotle or of uh, Kant and Plato, and it's like, yeah, but some of it, you're like, dude, are you even talking about Kant? Have you even read the dude? Uh, and some of, the, some of her praise of Aristotle, it's like, I don't think he would like your praise. But anyway, uh, I digress. Her novels, her fiction, I think, have this, this really bad quality about them that it's just so obvious that she's trying to put some philosophical agenda at the forefront. As opposed to like a novel by Dostoevsky. Now, I think when you read it, when you're done reading a book by Dostoevsky, it's not obvious, but you get you get a general sense of kind of maybe where he's going with it, kind of where his, you know, you know, which of the characters he might um, uh, that that he might uh, associate himself with more, that that he that he elevates more. But it's not obvious. It's not super obvious. And even the characters that are disdainful are complex, right? There's ambiguities among them, right? But I think, you know, in a novel like The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, it's so obvious who the protagonist is and sort of what the agenda of the author is. And, and for Dewey, that detracts, right? That's, it's not like, you know, the example I was giving Boys in the Hood. I mean, again, maybe you, you think that's a crummy movie. But if you liked it, you thought it was effective. You know, again, I, I, I think... To be honest with you, it's been a while since I watched the movie. I do think there are a few scenes in it that are kind of like a little too obvious, right? There's a few that are really effective. I actually think that uh, Spike Lee's film from you know a couple years before that, Do the Right Thing, is is a much uh, a better um, uh, work of art, I guess, in that regard. It's a lot less 
didactic. It's more ambiguous, right? Here we have some after school specials, right? These are sort of like the, the epitome, I think, of what Dewey is talking about here. You know, you, these are really all, most of my students were not born yet when these were airing. I, I was barely born. And um, yeah, but I've seen them, right? They're just so obvious. They're so cheesy. And they're so obviously, you know, it's just, you know, kind of out of touch with reality a lot of them they over exaggerate some of the some of these these social problems and uh you know if you smoke marijuana you'll start doing heroin the next week or something like this right uh so they're kind of silly but they're obviously morality plays okay and for for dewey this is not art right this is this is antithetical to art okay so it's for similar reasons that we are repelled by the intrusion of a moral design in literature while we aesthetically accept any amount of moral content if it is held together by a, a, a sincere emotion that controls the material, right? So if it's a sincere emotion, a, a sincere expression, uh, an artistic expression, we can deal with somebody bearing their soul and maybe even going on a rant about their own sort of morality and what they really feel. If it's sincere and authentic, then it can be passionate and artistic, right? But if it's just like, you know, the, the, the writer is using their, 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 uh, their talent or their skill in constructing sentences for an obvious purpose, and it's just so obvious, then for Dewey, obviously this detracts from the enjoyment and the aesthetic quality of that work of art. Uh, so he doesn't, again, he doesn't want us to make the opposite mistake of associating expression with, you know, just this emotional outburst, right? Obviously passion and emotion are going to have to be a part of artistic expression, but just simply bursting out is not expression in his sense of the word. So he says, indirect outburst in objective situation is the stimulus, the cause of the emotion. In the poem, objective material becomes the content and matter of the emotion, not just its evocative occasion. Without emotion, there may be craftsmanship, but not art. It may be present and be intense, but if it is directly manifested, the result is also not art, right? So you can go too far one way and be this ultra craftsman that, you know, the product is, you know, like I think Ayn Rand's novels, it's just very sterile and kind of lacking passion and emotion. It's just very didactic is the word I like to use. It's obviously, she's trying to teach you some lesson uh, and it kind of is off-putting, right? Uh, to me, so it's not very effective. But it, it was good. I, mean, I read it when I was a teenager, honestly. And when I was like 16, and I was high school, I think I was a sophomore, junior in high school. I, I mean, I loved it, right? I thought it was great, right? But I've tried just like years later to, you know, since, since then I've read a lot of other stuff, I guess, to compare it to. But anyways, I keep digressing on Rand. I don't know why. So, but, but his point here too is that you, you can take it like Ayn Rand and maybe she's, you know, she's, she has these long sentences that are very well constructed. I mean, that's debatable, but you might say the plot is interesting, right? Definitely, that's, there's a lot of drama. Uh, it's, you know, it's definitely, you know, some of it's exciting. Um, you know, some, some of it's not horrible. It's horribly written, but it's just so obviously um, it's got an agenda, right? So that, that you know, for, for, for Dewey be stiff. But then on the other hand, if you go to the other extreme where it's just completely just emotional outburst, you know, for him, that's, there's no craft to it either. That's, that's not art as well. Okay. So, you know, for him, you know, he uses Van Gogh as kind of an example. And I think he's, you know, come on, Van Gogh, he's not that crazy, but whatever. He says, many of the paintings of Van Gogh have an intensity that arouses an answering chord. Uh, you know, they, they strike us, okay? But with, but with the intensity, there's an explosiveness due to the absence of assertion or uh, of control. In extreme cases of emotion, it works to disorder instead of ordering material. Insufficient emotion shows itself in a coldly correct product. Excessive emotion obstructs the necessary elaboration and definition of the parts, right? So again, too emotional, it becomes chaotic, it becomes distracting, doesn't have that satisfying uh, cumulative effect that he sees in our aesthetic experience. But if it's too calculated, if it's too affected, then um, it, it's too stiffed, right? It's too cold, doesn't have the uh, proper um, aesthetic effect either. Okay, so more, this long quote here, he's gonna get more detail about 
this process of inspiration and how it leads to eventually artistic expression. We're almost done here with this chapter. I've only got a, maybe a few, uh, few more slides to cover, right? And so we'll wrap it up here in about you know, five or 10 minutes. And then next video, we'll get to move on to uh, the next chapter on the expressive object. <clears throat> so for Dewey, we're all capable of being artists in a certain sense. And what we lack is not the emotion, right? And it's not even the technical skill. He says here, it's the capacity to work a vague idea and emotion over into terms of some definite medium. So I suppose with practice, we could get the technical skill. And we all just, by being a living organism, uh, we all have emotion. We can't help but have it. It's just a part of being a living organism, reaction to the environment. So we've got those two ingredients that are necessary to be an artist. The problem is we don't know how to do it. We're at a loss for words maybe, I guess, or we're not sure how to use art to do it. We just do it directly, right? We directly express those emotions through our actions instead of finding a channel through art. Okay, so that's what makes the artist different. They know how to do this. So between conception and bringing to birth, there lies a long period of gestation. During this period, the inner material of emotion and idea is as much transformed through acting and being acted upon by objective material as the latter undergoes modification when it becomes a medium of expression. It is precisely this transformation that changes the character of the original emotion, altering its quality so that it becomes distinctively aesthetic in nature, right? So the grape pushes through the wine press, that ultimate, so that, that, that um, original artistic impulse, that expressive impulse through this engagement with the material, with objective conditions, what kind of canvas I have, what kind of paints I'm limited to, dealing with problems that, that present themselves along the way, uh, this aesthetic product is created. So in formal definition, emotion is aesthetic when it adheres to an object formed by an expressive act in the sense in which the act of expression has been defined. Okay? So again, a lot of that's review. Uh, it shouldn't be anything super new. But I think for clarity's sake, right, let's elaborate a little bit more on this point about emotion, expression, and this indirect channel of the medium, right? So there's always an artistic medium involved. In its beginning, an emotion flies straight to its object, right? We have this girl here, her, she loves the, the boy, whatever, you know, cherishes him, you know, has this adoration and just kisses him on the cheek, right? It goes straight to the object. Love tends to cherish the loved object as hate tends to destroy the thing hate, hated. Either emotion may be turned aside from its direct end. The emotion of love may seek and find material that is other than the directly loved one, but that is congenial and cognate through the emotion that draws things into affinity, right? So there's something that is, you know, has an affinity to what I want to express. I love that person. I can't directly go kiss them, maybe because they don't like me back, maybe because they're, they're far away and they're traveling, so I have to write them a letter. Um, and so I find something with which to express. Verbal expression, he says, can take the form of a metaphor, but behind the words lies an act of emotional identification not an intellectual comparison, okay? So when Shakespeare writes this metaphor, can I compare thee, you know, may I compare thee to a summer's day, right? I, I totally botched that line, but you, you know the sonnet, right? He's not saying that you like, are actually like a summer's day, but there's this emotional identification with the feeling I get on a summer's day, right? And I, I can't go kiss the lover. I can't go embrace her. So I write a poem and what I'm feeling is this hot, you know, passion, this sort of burning up this, you know, summer's day, this temperate summer's day. Um, so you could see metaphor itself as an indirect channel, metaphor itself as a medium. In all such cases, Dewey writes, some object emotionally akin to the direct object of emotion takes the place of the latter. It acts in place of a direct caress, of hesitating approach, of trying to carry by storm. The impulse arrested in its direct movement towards its physiologically normal end is not, in the case of poetry, 
arrested in an absolute sense. It is turned into indirect channels where it finds other material than that which is naturally appropriate to it. And as it fuses with this material, it takes on a new color and has new consequences, right? So through that work of art, I'm able to express my love or my hate through, a, you know, for, in this instance, he's talking about poetry, so a poetic metaphor. And this, this, you know, a summer day, all of a sudden, reminds me of love, right? It reminds me of this passion burning for love when it once didn't before, as a new color. <clears throat> And this is an interesting point that he makes, right? This is, I'm wondering what Jung, you know, if you're in, familiar with Carl Jung and notion of the archetypes, I wonder what he would make of this. This is more of a biological, I think, account of what Jung wants to speak of psychologically. Okay? So Dewey talks about our impulses, these, these emotional impulses, and how through art and artistic expression, they become idealized, right? They become symbolized as something higher than just the basic base emotional impulses from where they began. This sounds a bit like Nietzsche too, now that I think about it. If you review some of the lectures on the birth of tragedy, right? The Dionysian is this element that can't be extracted from art. And the Dionysian is this sort of primal, you know, you know visceral, emotional, underpinning very animal natural primal and for him that's the sort of thing we're reacting to when we create these these works of beauty we idealize those impulses right so again i see a lot of nietzsche here i don't think dewey would be happy with that comparison but nevertheless i, I think it's valid so he writes this is what happens when any natural impulse is idealized or spiritualized that which elevates the embrace of lovers above the animal plane is just the fact that when it occurs, it is taken into itself as its own meaning, the consequences of these indirect excursions that are imagination in action. I love this quote. It's kind of obscure, right? But that last sentence, right? So, you know, what it elevates love be above the animal plane, right? We have these base biological desires to breed, right? That is you want to get as crude as you can get, right? You have the sexual impulse, okay? How does this get idealized into this view of romance and love that we all celebrate as a culture? Well, according to Dewey, it's through art, right? It's through artistic expression. Again, I think he would kind of on the same page with with Nietzsche here, right? But when he says that, uh, you know, this impulse is raised above the animal plane, right? Because it, um, it takes on its own, a meaning of its own, right? It, 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 its own meaning um, through these indirect excursions that are imagination in action, right? So we have this impulse for sex, for breeding, for lust, whatever you want to call it, as base as you want to get, right? These sort of Dionysian impulses, okay? And we need it to be uh, <laughs> alleviated somehow. We can't have it because of maybe we were unable to um, find somebody who requites this passion or whatever. Uh, you get the picture. And because of this, our imagination takes hold and we find another way to express it, to, to unleash it, to disperse, to discharge this impulse, right? And it gets idealized, right? Through the artistic image that we create, through the artistic product we create, the poem that we write or the painting that we paint uh, in honor of this, this emotion, right? That we, we felt. Right? So emotions are in a certain sense, the ingredients from which the aesthetic springs, right? Uh, or at least they're a part of it, of course. There's always gotta be that tension, and that engagement with the environment, but emotion is also a key element here, okay? This is something I think that if you're taking my class at U of H and you, you, know, you know your Kant and you know your Schopenhauer by now, this is something I think they would not be happy with, right? So you know, they, wanna, they wanna sort of banish emotion from aesthetic experience, but for Dewey, one cannot really do this. If you're doing it, you're ignoring uh, the basis for all art and all aesthetic expression. So for him, expression, and he's writing here, expression is the clarification of turbid emotion. Our appetites know themselves when they are reflected in the mirror of art. And, and as they know themselves, they are transfigured. Emotion that is distinctively aesthetic then occurs. It is not a form of sentiment that exists independently from the outset. It is an emotion induced by material that is expressive. 
And be, because it is evoked by and attached to this material, it consists of natural emotions that have been transformed, right? Probably could have skipped this quote here. He's sort of repeating a lot of what he said so far, right? The point he's making, you know, there's there, the, that, that, that emotion, it has this, has this very important role in artistic expression. And the fact that we all have these emotions, we directly sort of feel is what makes art so effective, right? It's what makes Boys in the Hood more effective, you know, than this sociological study on race and police brutality, right? However great and, 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 and well-researched it is, it's still not gonna hit us home the way that Boys in the Hood is, right? I'm noticing now this video is getting a lot longer than I had anticipated, and we've only got this one last slide left. This is it, okay? We'll be done with this chapter. But it's such a long quote, so I think I'm, you know, what I'll do, instead of reading it here, and instead of finishing this video with the end of uh, chapter four, what I'm gonna do instead is I'll start the beginning this is probably a better idea. And it seems like things have been kind of working out this way anyway. I'm just going to start the next video with this quote. So we'll kind of wrap up chapter four and then we'll dive into chapter five, which is a lot shorter. It's not shorter in the full version, but in our textbook, right, for this class I'm teaching, uh, this, the extract is pretty short. So hopefully that next video will be pretty quick. We'll get through it. Uh, uh, it won't take us too long. But again, thanks uh, as usual sticking around to the end of this one. Uh, and I hope to see you on the other side. Let me go ahead and stop sharing the screen. And we're we'll exit this meeting and au revoir.